are we watching Mr. Boozman? Uh, yeah, but but Bozeman, Bozeman is the campus, right? Isn't he from uh, University of Montana, Bozeman? I don't know. I just like watching Mr. Anderson. Yeah, he's, he's, he's the good. AP bio. He's good. He's good. He's good. I know. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to watch him because um, I figured we should touch on the, the chemistry Nobel for this year, you know? Mm -hmm. That way we'll we're only 20 years behind the curve. It's important. It's important to stay 20 years behind. <laughs> no more than 20 years behind. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Anderson taught me AP Bio because my teacher in high school didn't really know. It was her first time teaching AP Bio. Oh, nice. And she was like, we're just going to watch YouTube videos <laughs> the entire time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, although, you know, I actually, um, I'm, I'm collecting videos for my summer class. I'm going to teach these um, Brainiac high schoolers. And um, uh, there's some really good animations out there. Maybe we can look at one of them, too. But, um, and their molecular dynamics, you can tell that they're, they're not just cartoons. You know, they're actually molecular dynamics simulations. And um, so I've been looking through these and I found one that was like, what? It's like misconception. I mean, it's, it's well, it's well meaning, but it's just full of misconceptions. So I'm going to get on my high horse and be critical of them and ask the students to be critical of them so that they can learn to ride a high horse too. Okay, guys, I see Dan, Leslie, Aditya, Ikun, Lily, Ivy, Calvin, hi Calvin, Adam, Roger, Kenya, we're missing Richard and uh, Pauline, and hopefully nobody else, because I don't know who the hell, I don't know who the hell's in this class. <laughs> I'm old. I'm old enough. Oh, Dr. Terrell, I was going to ask you. Yes. So are you, are you going to be teaching in person? I remember you saying that you wanted to teach in person next semester. Are you going to yeah, have Yeah, I'm going to do a lab. I'm not going to be allowed to do a lecture. But I oh, will so, do a, So 155 I mean, is going to be in person lab? Yeah, there's going to be It's going to what people are only going to meet like 3 times during the semester. Oh really? Just what? How? Uh, in lab because because we can only accommodate nine per nine people per lab, and so that's like about half the normal number, right? And so yeah. so maybe 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 four or five meetings of max. I think that's okay. We can do some we can do some fun things. You know, I'll just set everything up and have folks kind of just have a little bit of experience with the instrumentation. Hey, Richard. So then the rest of the lab time, because isn't your lab like super early in the morning too? So then the, the lab time would be online stuff, like we, what you did with our class where you were like just teaching about the data that we would collect. Is that what? You don't know? <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but I am so glad to see Adam and Kenya and Calvin and Daniel and Richard and Carla and the rest of you. I am very glad you're here, but I cannot see you. So we are going to watch. Have a car right now. <laughs> oh, okay, that's all right. Don't turn your don't don't talk. Don't do anything. Don't interact until you get to a safe place. I don't want to hear any crunching metal sounds from your. <laughs> I'm not the one driving, Dr. Carol. <laughs> oh, good, 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 excellent. All right, okay. So let's listen to the CRISPR talk. Okay, so this is a dude, I think he's from uh, University of Montana, Bozeman. Okay. 
cannot hear a single thing he's saying. Yeah, we can't hear anything, yeah. Carol. Damn it. Okay. How do you I might, do that? You might have to go into your share screen settings and sometimes there's oh, like screen allow settings. audio. <laughs> I think there's like a setting where you can allow audio from like your computer. Participantes, seguridad, video stop. Let's see. Uh, okay. Let me find my other little. No, nothing there. Hmm. Okay. Uh, which one should I look under? Remote control? No. More. Ivy posted a link because I think we were <laughs> only hearing it through your microphone. I know. I know that sucks. From Ivy Trent. Thank you, Ivy. Ah, it doesn't work when multiple screens are being shared. Screw it. Okay, I've never ever done this before. I'm gonna unplug my second screen during, wait, no, I better, I better not do that. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. Oh no, he's gone. All right. Am I back? Well, um, not your camera, but yes, you're back. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. That's okay, that's okay. Screen sharing is not because the external monitor is disconnected. Duh, because I disconnected it. Share a screen, share my screen. Now, now I've got to do, um, look on share computer soon, wait. Share computer sound. If I saw fucking share computer sound, I would have done it already. It should be on the window when you're selecting the screen that you're sharing. Okay, so that would be under new share, right? <gasps> share computer sound. There it is. Alvin, what's up? Oh, you have to get back in the building? How are you going to do that, man? I'm teaching. Well, um, okay, I'll try to tear away in a few minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, just wait. Hang in there. Okay, bye. Stupid students. There's nothing that would be wrong if we got all rid of all the students in this university. Except for you guys, of course. Where is my YouTube video? What is CRISPR? Yeah, Bozeman science. It's probably Bozeman. Like most things in molecular biology, CRISPR was first identified in E. coli. You can hear it now, right? Yes, Perfect. loud and clear. Very loud and clear. And if we break apart the acronym, it stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Now that's a mouthful, but it does tell you the two main parts found in CRISPR. First of all, we have the repeats. These are going to be short segments of DNA, so 20 to 40 letters in length, and they're going to be palindromes. Remember, a palindrome is a sequence of letters that read the same left to right, like never, odd, or even. So we're going to have these letters that are palindrome. The reason why is that when you transcribe that DNA, you make RNA that forms these little hairpin turns. So we've got the repeats. Those are all identical, one after another, after another, after another, but they're interspaced. And so what's in the middle, we're going to have what's called spacer DNA. Now, what's interesting about the spacer DNA is that it's not identical. Each segment of spacer DNA is going to be unique. And this puzzled scientists when they identified this back in the 80s and 90s. But in the 2000s, what they found is that that spacer DNA, that's the important DNA, matches 
matches up perfectly with viral, especially bacteriophage DNA. They also identified a number of genes associated with CRISPR. So these are the CRISPR associated or CAS genes. Now those CAS genes will make CAS proteins. The CAS proteins in general are going to be helicases. Those are proteins that unwind DNA and then nucleases, those that cut the DNA. And so the idea was perhaps this is an immune system for bacteria, a way they could fight their old nemesis, the bacteriophage. And that's exactly what's going on. So if we have a picture of E. coli, this would be the cell membrane, cell wall right here. This would be the genome of the bacteria. I'm, I'm highlighting the CAS and the CRISPR system. And so when the bacteriophage injects its DNA, what normally would happen if you don't have an immune system is this DNA would hijack the cell. It could become embedded in the genome, but more importantly, it would make a bunch of these bacteriophages and eventually kill the cell. But since it has this CRISPR system, what it's going to do is it's going to transcribe and translate proteins, so this Cas complex, and it's also going to transcribe that DNA to make what's called CRISPR RNA, and it'll fit right into this protein like this. What is this? It's a way to fight that viral DNA. It essentially breaks it apart, and so before the infection starts, the infection essentially has ended. Now, you might say that's interesting, but what happens if it's injecting DNA where we don't have a spacer that matches? Well, the CRISPR-Cas system works there as well. It's going to create a different class of protein, a class one Cas protein, and what that'll do is it takes the DNA in, it breaks it apart, but more importantly, it takes that DNA and copies it into the CRISPR system. So what is CRISPR? It is spacer repeat, spacer repeat, but the spacers are essentially history of old infection so we won't be infected again. This is exactly the way your immune system works on a much larger level. You're making antibodies and then you have white blood cells that'll envelop that invader. But what's scientists thought is if we could hijack this CRISPR system, we could perhaps use it, because this is a living cell here, to either inactivate genes or maybe even embed new genes. And so the search was on. And the one that you'll hear most about is the CRISPR-Cas9 system. This was identified in the labs of Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. And what she was working on was Streptococcus pyogenes and their Cas uh, CRISPR system. And what's interesting about it is that they only had one Cas protein we call that Cas9. Now it doesn't look like this, it looks like this, but if we look at its major structure, it has a nuclease. So it's got this section right here where it can cut DNA here and it can cut DNA here as well. In S. pyogenes, they also are creating two long strips of RNA. We have the CRISPR RNA. The CRISPR RNA is going to fit into the Cas, but they also have what's called tracer RNA. And so if we look at what that looks like in this bacteria, you've got the spacer segment. That's going to be the part that matches up with the corresponding uh, viral DNA. You have this tracer RNA that essentially holds the CRISPR RNA in place. And then this whole thing together forms this complex where we can break DNA. But what the lab thought is, wouldn't it be cool if we could modify this whole system? Use the one Cas9 protein, but let's put our own sequence of DNA right here. And then if we could somehow connect these two together, we'd have a really simple system. And that's what they did. They created the tracer RNA, CRISPR CRISPR RNA chimera. And so what's a chimera? It's this ancient mythological beast. It's a combination of all these different species. And so what they've done is created a new type of RNA. And they've got a system that's really simple. It's got two parts in it. You've got the Cas9 protein, and then you've got this chimera. And since we're making this simpler, let's just call this the guide RNA. These are the two parts of a CRISPR Cas9 system. This is going to be the CRISPR part. It's going to be the RNA that's got the information of where we want to cut. And then we've got the protein that's actually going to do the cutting. And this is what happens. And so if we've got a little bit of DNA, so this is the DNA that we want to cut, we create a guide RNA that's going to have a corresponding bit of RNA. What happens is the DNA will feed into it like that. Once it's in place, we're going to cut it right here, and we're going to cut it right here. And so we do this little snip, and now we have an inactivated gene. We've broken the gene. Now the cell will try to fix it. It'll do some insertions and deletions, creates mutations. But what we can do a lot of the time is we can inactivate that gene. That's what the bacteria are going to do. But since we've created it, we can cut the DNA wherever we want to cut the DNA. We essentially just have to know what is the sequence 
sequence of DNA that we want to cut, put that into the guide RNA, and then we can cut it. Now, let's say we want to make this more complex. Not only do we want to break a gene, but let's say we want to insert a new gene. Well, now the system's going to just have three parts. We've got the Cas9, we've got the guide RNA, and then we've got the host RNA that we want to put in. So as we we break the DNA, the host DNA is going to be added, and then the DNA is going to fix it. So essentially, we've added the gene to the cell. Now, what's cool about the CRISPR-Cas9 system is it does this in living cells, and it can cut the DNA in multiple different places. So how could we use this? Well, let's say somebody has cystic fibrosis. What we could do is use a system like this to fix the genes in that person. Or in the future, we could engineer a new embryo. You can kind of see where this is going. But more importantly, I hope you know what a CRISPR system is. In review, a CRISPR system is an immune system that was identified in bacteria and then modified in humans, and I hope that was helpful. Dr. Terry, you might have to re reset your mic, or reset your audio, because you're... So you sound like a robot. Much better. Oh God! Well, at least I know how to get around that. So the audio was horrible on that old, that whole torturous, torturous session was marred by horrible feedback on my microphone. Is that correct? Only occasionally. Oh, okay, okay, all right. So um, <clears throat> let us um, let me think about this. I'm gonna see if I can. Um, I'm gonna see if I can make a um, whiteboard here. There we go. So, um, was that um, helpful for anybody? I hope. Maybe a little bit. No comment. So, um, so uh, by making the chimera, it's RNA or DNA? I can't remember. It's probably RNA, right? RNA. Yeah, they make the chimera RNA. And that's where you encode your, um, uh, your, your site. Uh, or cleavage, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm no biochemist here. I'm just sort of going here, right? And then, um, and then, and then Doudna and Charpentier, um, they develop the. Um, editing tools, right? So now, if you have a, um, a sequence, and I don't know how many bases, it's probably, it's probably limited to maybe 20 bases. 20 base pairs, oops. Right, is the, is the length of the sequence that you can match between those palindromic repeats. Um, any time this uh, Cas9 chimera um, uh, hybrid or aggregate or whatever you want to call it, comes along this 20, this, this particular sequence, it will cleave it at, the, at that point. So 
but it will also, but there's also um, uh, ways to add and to delete um, sequences, right? By using using CRISPR Cas9 and other other hardware. So the question is, how do you get this into cells, right? How do you how do you do this in living cells? And I don't know the answer to that. That's that's um, you know, I, I think you can make you can put CRISPR or Cas9 into plasmids, you know, which are um, circular. Oops. Uh, DNA. Um, uh, circular DNA, basically, and um, uh, you can you can sometimes transfect these into cells. Or you can inject it into if you like in the case of these Chinese, this Chinese guy who is now in jail. Yes, thank you very much, sir, for your contribution. Wait, did they actually catch him? I thought he was on the run. I th well, I didn't hear that he ever was ever on the run. I just heard that I heard that he did it and he was talking about it and saying, Oh, look at me, I'm, I did a great thing. And then next thing I heard, he was like in prison in China or something. But I could be wrong. Anyway. Wait, who? There 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 there's a okay, yeah, we gotta give the backstory here. There's a there's a Chinese researcher who um uh who basically so, engineered uh using casper uh some cells or actual embryos and mm -hmm. they were twins and one of them is now like immune to hiv and the other one isn't um, okay wait 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 hold on hold on, hold on, hold on. yeah they, they 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 crispered several human uh embryos or, or actually, just the I think it was just the eggs, right? And then, and then they, then they fertilized them in vitro, and then, uh, at least one of them they brought to term, and the idea was to uh, knock out a, a protease, which is associated with resistance to HIV, but there's no evidence that that actually worked, you know. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> I thought yeah. that it, was, it was twins and that the lady uh -huh. like, came to term and one of them was like, oh. that actually had the HIV like immunity and the other, uh, the other twin didn't or something. Right, 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 right. Got it, got it. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Although, yeah, the, the, the hypothesis behind the, the protease is not, I don't know if that's really going to hold up over time, but. Anyway, but yeah, so that's kind of interesting. So now we know enough to be dangerous, right? Talking about CRISPR and Cas9 and everything. So um, when someone asks you, hey, what's CRISPR? You know, that they, didn't they win the Nobel Prize? You can say yes. It was uh, uh, Charpentier from France and Doudna from Berkeley. And I know I read Jennifer Doudna's book, but you know, I was super disappointed because it was just all about drama and ethics and everything, nothing about the actual, you know, the, the nothing that even gave me an idea that like this, um, like this uh, video just did. Okay. All right. So let us now uh, segue over into um, a new topic, and this is going to be on um, uh, fast protein folding measurements. I know this is a little seems a little bit dated. This is from 1996, and probably some of you were born after this was <laughs> published. Damn it. But the thing is that I don't think that a similar, I don't think that 
many similar uh, measurements have been made since then. Okay. Oh, there's there's a nature article. Which is that? What is the nature article? Yeah. Oh, it's about um, the CRISPR baby and the prison sentence and stuff. So I just put it on there for people to. Oh, see. thank you, thank you, thank you. Cool. And Adam asked. Oh, and Richard asking why the twenty base pair limit. I think it's just um, the the base pair is sandwiched between palindromic repeats. And I, and it it's actually a, it's actually there to match a part of the viral DNA. And it, there's there's definitely a limit to the size that it can be because it it's I think it's all contained in the protein, or you know on the surface of the protein. Oh, the lecture from Tuesday I thought I did, but I'll look into that. I'll definitely post it. Oh my God. I mean, that was the one where I gave away all the answers, right? I got to post it. So um, I, I will, I'll do that tonight. If it's not already posted, I promise I'll do that tonight. Um, it might be in my, it might be in my um, YouTube thing, but not on Canvas yet. So I'll check that. All right. So back to the paper here. Um, this is, um, uh, this is a paper on protein folding. And protein folding is, um, it remains, you know, a uh, very mysterious uh, phenomenon where there are literally, you know, for any protein of any, you know, significant size, say more than, you know, 50 or so um, peptides or 50 or so amino acids. Uh, there are, you know, billions and billions of different structures that it can have, that it can assume uh, as it's, um, you know, as it's created, right? So there's, you're all aware that, you know, there's the primary structure of proteins, which is the order of amino acids. There's the secondary structure, which is alpha helix, beta sheet, and God knows, you know, there's other uh, structures, but um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get it up there. So um, uh, you see the other structures and um, and then those those secondary structures fold together and they create a, a, a three-dimensional structure for the protein from which the protein derives essentially all of its um, uh, Uh, from which the protein derives all of its um, function, you know? So like if it's got to bind DNA, it's all about how these hydrophilic end groups are uh, arrayed out on the surface of the DNA. If it's got to bind heme, it's about this hydrophobic pocket, you know, and, you know, you know, all the brilliant, just, amazing, mind-bogglingly complex molecular machinery that are proteins. It's all basically a function of their three-dimensional structure, which is function in turn of their folding state, right? So this is the first experimental um, foray into fast protein folding. This is in the nanosecond regime, right? And I think it's just a really clever example of many different um, analytical techniques being deployed on a single um, uh, unwitting protein sample in order to untangle some of the uh, mysteries about the, um, the folding. So one thing that is learned from this definitely is the total folding time scale, right? And it's um, uh, between 15 nanoseconds and a half a millisecond. So, so that's um, um, uh, 15 nanoseconds to 15 microseconds is 
is a factor of a thousand, then 15 microseconds to 15 milliseconds would be another factor of a thousand, but it's closer to a factor of 50. So it's probably more like 50,000. Uh, the dynamic range in time of this measurement is around 50,000. So the short, from the shortest time scale that you can measure, the longest, there's many orders of magnitude that are recorded in this in this experiment, right? And the um, the the folding occurs on a twenty microsecond time scale. So um, that is a pretty remarkable achievement, I think, in terms of learning about the dynamics of protein folding in on this short time scale, right? So. Um, So um, let's let's jump to a description of the cell that was used, and I'll start to um, describe this experiment. So, firstly, uh, you have a, a a a small cell. There's a glass slide. There's a cover slip, and in between those, there's a small channel, in which uh, some of this apomyoglobin uh, is in solution, right? So it's sitting in a, in solution here and at the focal point of several optical uh, uh, things here. There's an infrared beam here, which can be pulsed on and off. There's an ultra ultraviolet beam that focuses in here. This is called a pump beam. Then there is, um, from that same point in solution, uh, the light is focused, the light is collected and sent to a photomultiplier tube so that you can pump the fluorescence of a tryptophan residue on the protein and collect the uh, relaxation spectrum on a photomultiplier tube. And by relaxation spectrum, I'm really talking about the relaxation intensity versus time. So um, here's the UV light coming in. You, 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 and you can pulse the UV and collect the, the light. And then if you do this enough times, then you can create a, a picture of an exponential decay, which is characteristic of the local environment of a tryptophan residue on the protein. So um, basically, now this, this lifetime, this tryptophan lifetime, is what we're going to use to estimate the folded state of the protein. So there, now protein folding is obviously a multi-dimensional phenomenon, right? But what we're focusing on here is um, a very simple um, aspect of this, which has to do with the proximity of um, a tryptophan and a methionine. So can you guys all see this um, figure here? Somebody say yes, Dr. T. Yes, or... Dr. T. Yes. <laughs> thank yes, you. Dr. T. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So you can see this guy, right? And there's a the tryptophan. And there's a the methionine, right? And what happens is that the tryptophan is normally fairly heavily quenched by this uh, sulfur, uh, sulfhydryl group on the methionine. No, no. The, the, the thioether group on the methionine. And um, so it has a fairly short lifetime, right? However, when the protein is unfolded, these guys come out of close contact and the tryptophan lifetime increases significantly. And so this is what, is, this is what we're looking at 
mainly to, de to determine the folding state of the protein. So there's one other wrinkle on that as they try to push it a little bit farther. And there's actually two components to the relaxation of the tryptophan fluorescence. There's a short and a long component. And we'll look at that um, uh, as time moves forward. Um, in terms of how to understand the system, right? But, um, but uh, for right now, let's just let's just get try to get a fix on what's going on in this picture here. So um, I'm going to come here. And I'm going to say uh, remote control. I'm going to hand it over to somebody. I think I'm going to hand it over to Adam. You know why? Because Adam has a mouse. And Adam's going to point to this, point to the diagram over here. He's going to point to this diagram. And he's going to either ask me what something is or tell you what something is. And then I'll chime in as well. OK, Adam, go ahead. Excellent. So point to the IR beam. Brilliant. So what is, so the IR beam is actually a pulse. Pulse is only about 15 nanoseconds in duration. So when that IR beam pulses on, the temperature in the cell jumps by about 20 degrees Celsius in about 15 nanoseconds. So what happens to the folding state of the protein during the instant of heating, Adam? And I don't know is a valid answer. Okay, are you on strike, Adam? I think he can't unmute himself. Oh! Oh, there we go. Uh, okay. I gotta find the other screen here then. Oh, there and it is. You have flashcards, like note cards you can hold up. <laughs> <laughs> is it because you you're able, like you're using the mouse on Dr. T's screen? I'm trying to unmute you now. Okay, so <laughs> when you when you gave me control, I did not have access to chat, and I don't have access to unmute myself. Even my keyboards uh, <laughs> control would not let me unmute myself. <laughs> I was trying to tell you tell you to take back control. <laughs> take back control. Thank you, Richard and Carla. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Okay. <laughs> I have no yeah. idea. You're not seeing my screen, right? No, no, but we can. But you can move the mouse on the screen that everybody's sharing, right? Oh, no, you, that's know. what was happening, right? What was happening? So, like, you were moving the mouse on the screen, right? So now I'm moving it. Yeah, and you can move it too. I think. Yeah, when you give me control. All of my settings in terms of muting, chat, everything was gone. I could not get it back. Don't know why. I don't know what the hell's going on. Show meeting control. I should be able to give you guys oh, more control, right? I found it. Okay. I found it. <laughs> okay. So um, okay, what are we doing? I panicked for okay. like so right three now minutes. we're we're attempting to talk about the infrared pulse. Right? Okay. So the infrared pulse heats um, Heats the cell at about a billion degrees per second. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you, Richard? It means that the protein, I guess, it, I mean, it might change its uh, folding its mm -hmm. 3D structure. And that's what we're going to measure with this cell, right? 
Right, right, exactly, exactly. So what about the heating rate of a billion degrees per second? Pretty quick. What? That seems pretty, pretty quick. And that's what you it might seems pretty with. quick to me too. But it's actually, you know, the way that it's accomplished is actually by having, you know, all of the optics in the IR beam path here, they're all IR transparent, right? So none of them absorb any IR radiation. So nothing else is heated by this pulse except this little bit of water that's right in the middle of the beam there. It needs to be a tiny amount, a tiny volume of water too, right? To yeah, exactly, 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 that's right. And it's thin also, it's about 100 microns, I think, um, layer of water. And they, they, they took pains to make sure that the absorption of the water was such that was low enough that there wasn't a significant diminution of the beam intensity throughout its transit through the water layer. So what that means is that to as good an approximation as we can have, the entire disk of water in this, in the infrared beam heated up uniformly at a million degrees or at a billion degrees per second or so, maybe 10 billion per second, right? Okay, so um, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to another question, which may be a little bit advanced, but just shut me up or whatever. Um, and uh, that is, if you're a protein and your folding state depends on the temperature of the water that you're dissolved in, what is this sudden, and by sudden I mean, you know, within, uh, 10 nanoseconds increase of 15 degrees in the water temperature gonna gonna do to your folding state so um, the answer there is well there's let me let me put it up this way a it's not going to do anything or B, it's going to change the folding state. Who, who answers A? And then, oh, Adam said C. <laughs> Adam, Carla says it's going to change. Adam says it depends. Okay. So it's actually a good, so nothing from Aditya or Dan or Dan says B, 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 B. Okay, good. So I fooled everybody because it doesn't do anything. Because the time frame is so damn short. In 10 nanoseconds, you know, the water has warmed up, right? But the folding state actually responds on the microsecond time scale. So, I mean, this is a, an approximation, right? But to a good first approximation, this, this protein is first at equilibrium with a low temperature, and then boom, now the temperature is hotter, and it's not at equilibrium anymore, but it hasn't had a chance to change its folding state. Does that make sense? Does the cell stay warm? Sorry? Does the, the cell stay warm when the Actually, eye is pulsed, right? So it's... Okay, so this is, this is another good question. And, and the, 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 the cell stays cold. They, they keep the cell at I think it's minus four degrees Celsius. And there's enough salt in there that it doesn't freeze. But it's just really cold. 
and it's as cold as you can get the water without making it into ice. Right, and then they pulse it with this IR laser, and in, a, in an instant, that region of space is heated by 15 or 20 degrees, boom. And then the protein starts to come to equilibrium with that new temperature, right? So, Daniel. Have you ever heard of hot denaturation of proteins? Yeah, it's not really. I mean, are you talking about just how when proteins heat up, they'll break apart? Right. Oh, so, yeah, I mean, that's pretty common. There's like a temperature range, like for even for anything made of protein, right? Even like animals have a temperature range because their proteins mm -hmm. have a temperature range. Exactly, exactly right, exactly right. So, um, uh, if you boil an egg, you denature its proteins, right? And they, and they cook. Yeah, they like rearrange uh, to form new uh, compounds. Yeah. It's originally a gel, kind of. It's a liquid, like a, a hydrogel or something like that. It finishes all of its cross-linkings. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know about the cross-linking. It's possible. And I don't know that it necessarily cross-links physically, right? Like chemically, right? Carla, do you know anything about this? Sorry, wait, what was the, what's the exact question? I got a little confused. When, when, you, when you cook and if you, if you boil an egg, let's, 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 let's boil this down to boiling. If you boil an egg, then, you know, the, the clear part turns white, right? Mm -hmm you're denaturing the proteins. And, and I, I, I'm proposing that that's due to denaturation yeah. of the protein. That's like the, the example for protein denaturation. Right, exactly. So it's hot denaturing. And Dan is saying that there may be some cross-linking happening. Well, I guess I mean more of recombination of the products into a, like a solid object. Because mm -hmm. if you just break mm -hmm. it down into its individual components, it's going to be not any, there's no structural. Right, right, right. Yeah. Fortunately, the peptide bonds are really strong. And this was a, a, a real surprise to me, but they're like thousands of times stronger than esters, you know. So, um, so the cell is actually kept cold. And this particular protein, this apomyoglobin, is actually unfolded in the cold state. It undergoes what's called cold denaturation. And therefore, you can take that protein in equilibrium with a, in a denatured equilibrium state and suddenly heat it up so that now the protein has to come to equilibrium with a hot folded state. Does that make sense? No. Okay. So um, we want to measure the kinetics of folding, right? It makes sense now. <laughs> okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. Good, good. And so, and the reason that we use a cold, well, here, let me put it this way. Why do we use a cold denatured protein to do fast kinetics? Because it's easier to heat something up rapidly than like otherwise. Okay, what's the opposite of heating it rapidly? Raising something. Cooling it rapidly, right? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Because you can heat stuff really easily, really quickly. You use a YAG laser, it has a 15 nanosecond pulse, and boom, you pulse it, and boom, it heats up. Right? But if you want to do the opposite, 
there's no such thing as a cold ray unless you're Mr. Freeze. And if you're Mr. Freeze, we want to talk privately about your patent. Right? Is there such a thing as a freeze ray, Calvin? There is no such thing as a freeze ray, unfortunately. So, um, but there is such a thing as a heating ray, right? And this heat is, this uh, 1064 nanometer radiation from the YAG comes and it heats uh, the overtone, the third overtone of the water um, anti-symmetric stretch. And it heats up that water real uniformly and real quickly. And, um, and, and then, uh, and so that's how you initiate the folding process, right? But is by taking it from the unfolded cold state to a hot state, and then the protein is gonna try to catch up thermally with its surroundings by folding. Okay, so now during that folding process, you're also gonna be pulsing a, an ultraviolet laser in to the um, into the cell here, right? And that is going to um, that is going to be exciting the fluorescence of a tryptophan residue here. And for every time you excite it, you measure the decay decay rate on a photomultiplier tube. So you, you, can, you can pulse this guy in and then, uh, uh, and then have the entire transient recorded within, um, I don't know, maybe 100 nanoseconds or less. Let's, let's look and see if we can't find a, an example of a trace like that. So. Yeah, so the entire transient is going to be, you know, less than 15 nanoseconds. So you could take this seven nanoseconds and that's the, the lifetime. So 7, 14, 21 is three tau or so. Definitely in, in within 20 nanoseconds, you can get an entire decay curve for the fluorescence, for the tryptophan resonance inside this, um, uh, uh, apomyoglobin. So, um, now there are two components to the decay. There's a short and a long component. And uh, they're plotted along here alongside temperature, right? So basically what we're doing is we're going from minus six or seven degrees here, suddenly jumping the temperature up to 20 and looking at the decay a constant over time at 20 degrees. So let's see here. So, um, who wants to tell me about the excitation and emission spectrum of tryptophan? It's right here. So which of these two is excitation and which is emission? One on the left is excitation. Yes. The one on the right is emission, right? Aditya. When I, when I do this excitation spectrum, what wavelength can I monitor the emission at? Looks like around 360. Perfect, perfect. Right, you come around here to the lambda max, to the emission, 
you monitor this wavelength and you scan this guy and at, at 2 230 here you're getting high counts you know relatively high counts as you scan up you get higher and higher counts keep scanning the counts come down all the counts are coming out at 360 excellent so now to get this emission scan at what wavelength are we exciting Kenya looks like 280 perfect perfect you can excite at 280 and look at all these emission scans great job great so when we look at the relaxation kinetics of the tryptophan fluorescence we're going to excite with a uv laser somewhere in this region right and we're going to detect with a photomultiplier tube somewhere in this region right so what's going to happen is we're going to turn on the power and we're going to look at the power decay at this wavelength does that make sense excellent so um now what are we going to learn from this so here is um the effect of temperature on tryptophan tryptophan yeah, tryptophan fluorescence <laughs> I can't talk anymore. Tryptophan fluorescence. Tryptophan fluorescence. Now, <clears throat> why is the intensity lower at 45 degrees than it is at 25 degrees? <clears throat> because at 45, it is already pretty much dead, 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 dead. Mm -hmm. I like that answer. Now, I would, I would, I would, um, uh, I would say also that there are other mechanisms quenching the fluorescence at forty that weren't there at twenty, because this is just tryptophan, right? This isn't actually, this is not tryptophan, tryptophan from the protein. This is just, uh, just tryptophan. I don't actually, I'm not sure. I think it's just tryptophan. But at higher temperatures, there are, there's more jostling of the molecules and they tend to relax more quickly at higher temperature. And so if they relax more quickly and maybe less radiatively, then, then this game goes away, right? Now, it, the experiments, let's say the experiments are all done at 25 degrees, right? Then that's fine. Okay. So let's look at this graph here. Here's the pH dependent. Oops, no, no. This is tryptophan concentration. Um, this is fluorescence versus tryptophan concentration, right? So notice here, this is a linear scale, and this is a logarithmic scale. So they're talking about high micromolar, medium and high micromolar concentrations. Then we're talking about medium to high millimolar concentrations. And up here are the high millimolar and low molar concentrations, right? So there is definitely an optimum to be sought here as well, because there are factors like self-absorption that can interfere with the fluorescence of tryptophan at higher concentrations. So these are somewhat instrumentally dependent factors here, but we know we would want to make the measurement at between say 10, and 100 millimolar, maybe, maybe 50 and 100 millimolar for the tryptophan. All right. So, um, what else can we say about this? Um, let's 
So interestingly enough, when this, depending on the uh, temperature of the uh, protein and its environment, the um, there will be differences in the turbidity of the solution here. And the turbidity is like the, the light scattering qualities. So a turbid solution scatters a lot of light. It's kind of like, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, milk is very turbid. You know, if you made a very thin layer, you could see through it. But beyond a few millimeters, you can't see through it, right? Because light that goes in scatters around off of all of the little fat globules, in it, right? So this diode laser is measuring the turbidity of the solution. They have a detector for it in the back. And it's, it's a monitor of the temperature, sort of the average temperature of the, um, of the solution in there, right? Then they have a thermocouple here that gives us even more averaged temperature, right? And then the, um, you know, to get the peak temperature, I'm not sure exactly how that's done. There's probably some calculations involved in the, um, based on the absorption of the infrared light, et cetera. But um, let's see what we can learn about the um, temperature dependence of the uh, tryptophan folding state. Or actually, let's take another step back then. And let's look at the our best guess as to the um, folding state of the protein as a function of temperature. <clears throat> so here is a temperature range through which you can conveniently sort of cycle this protein. And while I'm sure you can go up here, I'm not sure you can go back from this second denatured state here, right? But certainly from the cold denatured to a, a native state, you can transition between minus five and 25 degrees many times without um, undergoing any irreversible denaturation of the protein. So who can tell me what the difference between reversible and irreversible denaturation of the protein is? Reversible means that it can go back to its natural folding state, and um, irreversible means that it can't. Like an egg is not; it's that's irreversible because you can't get it back to its original state if you cook it. Excellent, 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 excellent. So, so, so what, what I'm saying here is, is um, we can't hear you. You sound like a robot. Okay. Thank you. Oh, yay. Oh, thank goodness. So, um, so as one goes up and down in temperature here, there, there are reversible changes that happen on the low temperature end, although I'm not quite sure that these high temperature changes are reversible. This is probably pretty much cooking it, you know. And apomyoglobin is this, um, it's, um, the apo means that there's no, there's no heme, but myoglobin is an oxygen transporting protein. Uh, it's very much like hemoglobin. And um, uh, myoglobin also has a heme unit, an iron heme in it, but apomyoglobin does not. So this is the, the heme-free form of myoglobin. And um, so um, I forgot the point I was, oh yeah. So what, what is being plotted here 
is the ellipticity of the of the uh, ultraviolet light absorption. So, um, can anybody explain to me what that means? Okay. Isn't this so, a circular dichroism spectra? Exactly, exactly right. It's a circular dichroism spectrum. And so, um, uh, in circular dichroism, what, what, there's, there's various incarnations of it. In this case, we're looking at absorption, circular dichroism, and the ultraviolet. And it just so happens that, you know, things like tryptophan have some absorption at 222. And there's a couple of other amino acids um, that have, um, like phenylalanine, maybe that's it. They have some, uh, w when, when a protein is folded and there's this fixed orientation between the groups, what will happen is that upon absorbing the light, it will not only absorb it, but it will also rotate the plane of the polarization of the transmitted part of the light. So that's a, um, a, not an easy phenomenon to unpack. But if, you, if we can understand it phenomenologically, that's all I would really go for here. And that is that if we, if we illuminate this um, protein with plain polarized light, then what we'll, we'll see that comes out is slightly the, the plane of polarization is slightly shifted, right? And for these measurements, they probably use a full centimeter path length in a dilute solution. And um, so um, so and also the circularly polarized light. So circular polarized light has a two component phase shift and the electric vector actually corkscrews through space. It's wild, right? Light can do whatever the bleep it wants to do. It can either be plain polarized like this or like this, or it can be circularly polarized, right? Or it can be any kind of elliptically polarized depending on the relative magnitudes of the two phases. And so the way that this circular polarization is detected is by the amount by which the different components are absorbed and it creates a different elliptical pattern in the absorption. Blah, blah, blah. That's not super important. What is important is that this is sensitive to the folding state of the protein. When your kids walk in and oven during these days, the hint just looks at everything and then leaves. So I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. I don't know why, but my microphone keeps unmuting by itself. So. Oh, that's all right. Um, did you have, were you commenting about the, uh, the uh, circular dichroism experiment? No, my sister walked in and said something, and that's exactly when my mute decided to unmute. And, uh, <laughs> decided to unmute. Exactly. That's the way it works. So, um, so basically, this ellipticity function here is telling us about the um, folding state of the protein. And I'm quite sure you can cycle it up and down here in temperature and reproduce these points. I'm not so sure about this part, right? Probably what they did was they started with it cold, they made all these measurements da -da 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 like this, right? And then they started getting up around 80 degrees and they got it up here, right? And this, and um, the protein up here is denatured, I suppose. And then they cooled it back down and they took this point 20 degrees, right? So the reason that this is important here is that they have these two baselines here, right? And these baselines are what they're using to estimate the equilibrium uh, ellipticity of the 
uh, native and the denatured states are, right? So from this information, you can simply say, well, um, uh, by interpolating between these two baselines, you can simply say that, well, at this temperature, it's, you know, it's unfolded by about 50%, right? Because we're, we're above the folded baseline and we're below the denatured line. So at this temperature here, minus six, we're about halfway unfolded. And that's what this metric down here means, right? Then up at 20 degrees, we're completely folded, right? So at 20 degrees, the fraction folded is up around one. So cycling between minus five and 20 degrees here, you can see that the equilibrium folding fraction changes by about 50%. Does that make sense? That, does that make sense for you, uh, uh, Kenya? Okay, Not really, but it's Not okay. Really. Okay, so we have a few more minutes and we can just use these few minutes to get clear on this. Um, so, um, and this is really, this could be completely wrong. You know, this could be like a complete F up on the part of uh, these authors is doing this, 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 this baselining business here, right? And, but let's just understand what they did. They, they took the protein and they denatured it, right? And they, they said, okay, well, if it's denatured, then it's going to be it's going to be kind of, it's going to have this slope in its ellipticity curve, right? Because 20 degree denatured protein is here and 80 degree denatured protein is here. So this is like a line that tells you what to expect for the extent of denaturation of a protein in this temperature range, right? And this, this lower line here tells you what to expect for the native, the folded state, right? And that any deviations from this line are transitions between denatured and folded. Because this is, ultimately a metric which is sensitive to folding, right? And there's these quasi-linear ranges. Therefore, wherever we are on this plot, places the protein, gives us a way to estimate the, the amount of protein that's folded at a given temperature. So Wait, if I were the to... bottom graph you're mm -hmm. saying is the the is it the baseline or is it the one that's the like the sigmoidal one? Excellent, excellent question. Excellent. So let's take this cold point here, right? This is exactly I think this is about 50% between native, the native line and the folded line. Right? So this point is probably this point right here, or maybe it's, or maybe it's like right about here. And this point here at zero looks like it's about maybe 20% folded and looks like it's about, so therefore it's, um, no, I'm, I'm, what I guess I'm trying to say is that it's closer to the native form than it is the denatured form. So 
it's more like 80% folded and and then you know a little bit unfolded. So that guy here at zero is up here around 0.8. Then we get up to 20 degrees here, and it's right along the folded line. It's far from the denatured line. So the equilibrium state for this protein is um, at 20 degrees, it should be approximately fully folded. So this should be around close to one, right? Then as we go up to higher temperature, this line reaches, it, it leaves the native line and comes up to the denatured line. So this one comes back down to the 0% folded range. Does that make sense now? Okay, so I've probably, um, I, I, I would be really surprised if I didn't bore half of you to, to tears with that long, boring explanation. But this is crucial to understanding. So what we're doing is we're making an, a sudden step to 20, and then we're watching the protein fold as it goes up that way. We're using fluorescence to do that. We're actually using fluorescence lifetime. So these are all equilibrium measurements, but if we make a sudden step, get it out of equilibrium, and then watch it fold, that's what we're gonna do. Okie dokie. So we'll talk more about this next time. Good luck on your, um, on your uh, uh, answering your questions. Don't make them too long. Don't sweat them too much. Just uh, tell me what you know. And uh, I will see everybody next time. Are there any questions? All righty. We will see everybody next time then. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome.